Hi there, I'm David Harvey, and I'm here with John Andrews, and this is the Two Techs Podcast. In this podcast, we're two friends in two different countries, here with you every two weeks talking about two different texts from the Bible. In this season, as we enter our second year of podcasting together, we step beyond the stories of Jesus in the Gospels and into the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is a series of stories and events from the early church when they encounter the disrupting presence of the Holy Spirit. So, John, the day of Pentecost came. All the disciples were in one place and... (laughs) We, we talked a lot about the significance of it being the day of Pentecost in the last episode. But now let's sort of circle back to the first few verses of Acts chapter 2. And we have sounds of wind. We have mm-hmm. what seems to be tongues of fire. And we have people speaking in other languages. <laughs> it's, it's quite the scene, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's, it's quite, quite a scene. It's quite a scene. It, Do you want to remind us of those few verses just as we dive in Acts chapter 2, just the first four verses? Yeah, absolutely. So it says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. A lot of stuff going on there, David. A lot of stuff going on there. (laughs) Totally. And I don't know about you, having both you and I have had a lot of exposure throughout our lives to Pentecostal churches. So these four verses feel like so familiar. (laughs) <laughs> like so yeah. very familiar to us. And yet at the same time, I, I find myself trying to read this for the first time and realizing just yeah. how bizarre, and I mean this respectfully, but just how bizarre this scene is. If you actually try and imagine it, you're like, oh my goodness, this is a this is a strange scenario to be in. Yeah, completely. And we are introduced to this work of the Spirit that we know will be a supernatural work, Mm. but at this stage, we don't know what the work of the Spirit is going to specifically look like in the lives of these new believers. We've seen seen the work of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. We've seen this, this idea of the Spirit descending in bodily form like a dove upon Jesus and this empowerment issue and Jesus going forth in the power of the Spirit. What's it going to look like for this first group of believers? And I think, of course, always the first one, the first moment is really crucial because the first one's going to really set the tone for this understanding of this spirit. And and I, I think it is fittingly dynamic. I think mm-hmm. it is fittingly other in its mm-hmm. in its experience because this is this is I I believe this is not just an experiential checklist. I think this is the Holy Spirit doing something so profound and powerful that no one in that room could go, oh, that was that was just a thing, or that was an emotion, or that was a, that was a, a little bit of had a bit of rush of goose pimples. He mm-hmm. does something so dynamic and amazing that no one in that room will misunderstand that they have had a supernatural encounter with God Himself. So I think it is profoundly and powerfully other mm. unusual and yet and yet and yet in the otherness i hear echoes of stuff we've seen before in the scriptures and some of the little mm. comments that we mm-hmm. see and capture in in the first four verses i mean i'm just I, i'm struck by the opening sentence day of pentecost came they were all together in one place and i, I just i mean i can't I can't read that. Maybe it's my years of just being around the church, but I can't read that without hearing Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when 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 pilgrims, brothers, are walking, dwelling together in unity. That one of those great psalms of ascent as they make their way towards the presence mm. of God, as they make their yes. way towards the temple of God. And and of course, in the context of that oneness, that agreement, that singular focus, that heart togetherness. Which I think is hinted in in the way that word is used there. Mm-hmm. You get this this outpouring of God's power, 
And, I, and I, I, Psalm 133 says, there the Lord commands his blessing in the place of oneness and agreement. God mm-hmm. commands his blessing. And and I, I, I hear an immediate nuance that, that this group of believers, however many and wherever they are, there is a singular agreement here that they need the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit and they're ready for the Holy Spirit even if they're not quite sure how the Holy Spirit's going to do what he does. The, the structure of the sentence in Greek seems to drive towards the notion of oneness as well. When the day of Pentecost, when it was the day of Pentecost, they were all there as one, right? It, it definitely seems that even the structure of the sentence in Luke's Greek sort of speaks to what mm. you're saying. I also think it's interesting with the familiarity of these texts, what is there? There's wind and there's fire. But but Luke's mm. use of simile is quite interesting. There was a sound. right? So, so yeah. we often say on the day of Pentecost, there was wind and fire. But notice what Luke says. There was a sound. <laughs> the sound and what he's in, the best he can describe it as is it's something like blowing wind. So I found myself yeah. reflecting just recently and is there, maybe there's no wind, right? So, so we imagine yeah. them being blown around, but actually... If we follow Luke precisely, there's just, it sounds the closest, there's some sound and the closest I can relate it to is a violent wind. And I love this idea mm-hmm. of the sound of a violent wind, but no wind. Or maybe there is wind, but yes. but he doesn't articulate it to us. And then we have tongues of fire, but even that, he says it seemed to be a tongue of fire. Yeah. So, so, so I think we've got Luke on the outer edges of language trying to describe this story. I imagine Luke, he writes this as eyewitness testimony, doesn't he? I imagine Luke listening to these stories, trying to hear the apostles explain what it was like to be in that particular scenario, in that particular scene. And the, the, the lack of being able to describe it I think becomes quite significant for the tongues that are about to happen. That this is actually yes. beyond what we expect. Oh, for for sure, for sure. And whether there is um, literal wind and literal fire, or this is the closest sort of imagery that Doctor Luke can get to in order to explain what he's heard the apostles explain to him, because he wasn't there. So mm-hmm. he he wasn't in that room. So he he wasn't an eyewitness to this event. So he's trying to explain what's been explained, and somehow even th- though there is a, a a little bit of sort of is it is it literal or is it mm-hmm. leaning into something greater and bigger in these ideas of wind or in the idea of I mean you could even translate breath, but but certainly mm-hmm. in the idea of wind and in the idea of fire, you've got some gorgeous sort of connectors through the scripture. Mm. So so we're being introduced to wind and fire, ideas that we've seen before yes. in the working of the Lord, in the, in the presence of the Lord, when the Lord is doing something significant, when mm. the Lord is getting people's attention. Breath, wind, fire are all markers of who he is in his presence. Mm-hmm. And so they, however it actually happened, it, it, it's fascinating to me that, that the illusions are illusions we're familiar with. And, yes. And I, I think that could be a deliberate idea in a Jewish mindset that the, these were things that a Jewish context would have understood and heard and seen and felt before in terms of their education and background. I love this idea of somehow them being familiarly unfamiliar or unfamiliarly yeah. <laughs> familiar or whatever the right way to, to say that is. You, yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Though? It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like wind. And when I hear, I could almost hear Luke unpack this, like, this sounds like a blowing wind. It, was, it wasn't a wind. Well, it was a wind. Well, it's, it's hard. It's hard to explain. And it's so again, to me, there's def- something is definitely happening. I hope I hope I don't sound like I'm suggesting, oh, it wasn't wind. It wasn't fire. What I'm saying, there is clearly something visual is happening. Something auditory is happening. It's clearly amazing to be part of it. These these things like tongues of fire are resting on the apostles' heads. I mean, this seems amazing. This seems miraculous. But I love it when I see a biblical author stretching to try and paint a picture for us of what was actually going on here. It speaks to something of the unknowability of God. There's always a space when we're talking about God where it's like, well, 
the best I can say is it was like this, <laughs> but but it was more than that somehow. And I, I just think that's that's the sort of beauty of language about God that we see in this moment of God arriving in their space. Yeah, and and I love your expression of sort of the the idea of knowing something but not knowing it, being familiar mm-hmm. but not familiar. And I think if you look at the moving of the spirit in other communities in Acts, for example, Samaria. We're not quite sure what happened, but it was so amazing that Simon the sorcerer <laughs> sort of wanted to buy it. It was yes. that amazing. In in Cornelius' household Gentile context, there there's no indication of wind or fire, but mm-hmm. there is this something goes on which is very familiar to the Jewish believers that they mm-hmm. were filled with the spirit just as we are. And the same with the disciples of John in Acts 19, there's no wind and there's no fire, but there is something of a commonality between what happens to them and what happened on Pentecost. So it, it could be, and I'm leaning into your familiar, unfamiliar, it could be that some of these markers are for a particular Jewish context, that there mm-hmm. is a sense in which God is doing something that is other. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Dr. Luke's struggling to explain it. And yet it's sort of... Jewishly familiar. Do you know what I mean? It's it's there's something about this that this particular audience sort of go, oh yeah, this looks mm-hmm. like God. This looks like or feels like God, or this sounds like the Lord, because mm-hmm. their history has shown a God who works in the breath or in the wind. Their history yes. has shown a God who reveals himself in the fire. I mean, again, back to Moses, mm-hmm. the Lord speaks out of a fire in a bush and and you're 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 getting he leads them and guides them in a pillar of fire so you get these incredible illusions of the fire and the wind the breath which lean into this magnificence of who god is that a a jewish worldview would have gone oh hold on a minute this is Mm. this is and yet in a a non-jewish world those markers don't seem to be apparent and i i love this idea that the lord Though the work of the Spirit is the same, the work of the Spirit can also be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. So there's a sense in which when you look at the outpouring of the Spirit in the four major events in Acts 2, 8, 10 and 19, there's a a familiarity, a similarity, and yet Mm -hmm. each experience is dynamically unique, apparently. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a uniqueness to the context and yet a sameness of the experience. Mm. And I love that. And I I would appeal, especially to our Pentecostal listeners, sometimes I think Pentecostals have been guilty of putting a cookie cutter template on the work Mm. of the Spirit. So Mm. this is the way it happened to me. This is the way it should happen to you. This is the way we've been taught it should happen. And and, and I absolutely do believe there are key markers, and we'll, we'll maybe lean into some of those things in the days to come. I do think there are key markers that point to a being filled with the Spirit. But how the Spirit comes and how the spirit fills i think can be can i say this reverently carefully context sensitive i i think there can be a sense in which the holy spirit is sensitive to the context as well as to his to his purpose i and i could be i mean i i could get my backside kick for that but i think the book of acts sort of helps us with that idea there's just there's a sense of what you're saying of, of of framing it like don't try and own what you can't properly mm. describe right and this True. there's this there's this the way that the holy spirit is presented to us in acts chapter 2 as slightly undescribable and the reaction is for people to speak not in one tongue but in other tongues so even even that is different in every case right that each person mm. speaks in a different language makes it difficult to box this down and therefore control it, which of course is exactly Mm. the same conversation that Moses has with his fire situation. Mm -hmm. But I want to kind of tell them who you are and I want to, and and, and God is constantly pushing us to realize that, that our desires to describe God are often rooted in our desire to own and control God. And and this God of the text, this God of the text is just not going to let us do that. Absolutely. I I think that's a profound thought. I mean I really do. And I would I I got I got very moved when you when you said that because that's a 
as a card carrying Pentecostal, I think if we're honest, we have been guilty of maybe levels of arrogance mm. and levels of self importance where we we know the Holy Spirit, we know about the Holy Spirit, we know how he works. And certainly if you look at the history of the charismatic renewal that hit the earth in the 60s and 70s, it were it was classical Pentecostals that struggled with some of that stuff because it didn't look like it looked for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we 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 maybe you, you you compare the experience of Jesus being filled with the Spirit and the and the experience mm -hmm. of these believers, and there's no correlation. Yeah. So yeah. Jesus gets filled with the Spirit. As far as we know, he doesn't speak in tongues in terms of the classic book of accents. The Spirit comes on him in bodily form like a dove. I mean, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, we, we celebrate that, but I've no idea what that means, really. Mm. And here now we have the Holy Spirit and we've got wind, we've got fire, and we've got languages never learned that are literally communicating to at least 15, 16 people groups. It, and I, what is that? And, and the minute yeah. you try to put a template on that, the minute you try to control that, I think, I, I just think then we are in danger of to use the dove analogy of frightening the dove away, of, of chasing the dove away. And, yes. and we do need to to understand, if there's some patterns in the book of Acts that help us to understand how the Holy Spirit works, we should be aware of those. And I think there are some patterns, and I would acknowledge mm -hmm. those patterns. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's different every time. And mm -hmm. you're going, like, what's going on there? So it's so so you, you are introduced to this other. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is other. And he's just like the rest of the God community. He is other and he will not be put in a box by a human and he will move as he needs to move uh, and sometimes even appropriately or inappropriately for the context. Yes. I don't know if that's making sense, but it, it certainly resonates with me, you know. I, I love it. And I think we have to remember that. And that perhaps does move us into say they began to speak in other languages as the spirit mm. enabled them as the spirit enabled mm. them this was not an advanced yeah. learning language program the, the implication <laughs> seems to be that they didn't you know these languages they weren't even aware what they were saying it was the other mm. people that were present that were able to realize that this is the worship of god uh, and i think even that speaks to the control and the and the unknowability of God, but also God's desire. I've mentioned a few times, I'm reading my way through Willie Jennings' commentary on Acts, and he makes this point that, that language, if you really commit to it, is is representative of a culture, right? It's, it's so, mm. so if you really, really want to understand the language, you also then need to go to the place and you need to learn to love the people and the food and their, their practices and the songs and the poetry and how, how they express emotion. So, so there's, this, there's this sense when you say, I love Spanish, right? You're probably saying more than just, I love how they structure a sentence, right? You're saying, I actually yeah. love these people and I love the way that mm. the Spanish or French or Italian or Germans sort of do things or, or English, depending on what perspective you're coming from. So actually this image of them speaking other languages is this mm. other image of God welcoming in all of this diversity mm. because it's saying that you too, in your own language, can hear the praises of God. Therefore, your culture and, and appreciation and joys are all welcomed as part of this Holy Spirit move. And, and I think that's a, it's a gorgeous thought for us about God's, God's welcoming of all of these cultures and peoples. Oh, it's beautiful. I, I do. I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think, again, as Pentecostals, sometimes we, we zero in on tongues as the experience that sort of affirms we've been filled with the Spirit. And then we sort of stop and we mm. don't realize, hold on, the tongues in the day of Pentecost, the first time this Spirit is poured out on a community in this way, the immediate expression of that is one of global inclusivity. Mm. I mean, it's just stunning. It's a stunning idea. And sometimes we miss the dynamic missional power of this moment because we're we're focusing on the experience of being filled with the Spirit. And, and I love this idea that people are hearing God being glorified in their own language and the people speaking those languages have no idea what they are saying. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. They've no idea what they're what they're communicating. But somehow, and we learn this later from Paul, somehow the Spirit of God is speaking to our spirit. Mm-hmm. And our spirit is speaking words that are, that actually make mm-hmm. sense, that actually say something. They yes. they they are not just communicating upward, but they're communicating outward. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I do think I think there is a glorious in this first mention of tongues, I think there is a glorious missional dynamic. It's become a bit of a battleground in terms of what's the sign that you're filled with the spirit. And I get that. I understand that. I'm cool with that. But actually, step beyond that just for a moment. And and what you've got is God's heart to communicate in the language of every person, his love. And and I love later on in the book of Acts, you know, when Paul's relating his testimony, Paul says that Jesus spoke to him in Hebrew. Mm. Um, and I love this. I, I I often say that when God speaks to me, he speaks in an Irish accent. And, and I do love this idea that the Lord has the ability to sort of speak to us mm. at at a level that, that we need to hear. And, and here on Pentecost, we're seeing God communicating through unlearned people in languages that they... And of course, when you do sort of research around, say, the outpouring of the Spirit at the turn of the 20th century, and you read magazines like Apostolic Faith magazine, which was part of the Azusa Street Revival, I've mm-hmm. literally read dozens of those copies as part of my PhD research. Story after story after story of people coming into a context where some of the adherents were large uneducated, speaking in mm. tongues in in a way that communicated in Arabic and Hebrew and other mm. languages. Just, just incredible. None of that is naturally possible, but you have this mm. supernatural, but it's not just a supernatural. And, and here's what I love about it, David. Sorry, I'm rambling a bit. Let me just say this. It, the, the ability to speak in tongues, though Paul talks later on about of it being an inward benefit to us. Actually, the first speaking of tongues is not about my benefit. The mm. first speaking in tongues, but the benefit of those who hear it. And again, mm. you get this gorgeous trajectory of the outpouring of the Spirit that this, the tongue speaking had an outward focus. The tongue speaking mm. wasn't about saying to Peter, oh, this is this is proof you've been filled with the Spirit. But mm. actually, Peter spoke in a language. We don't know what language, but he communicated with people. How, how are you doing that? Th- yes. This language was communicating outward, not just communicating inward. Mm. And I think that that is something that Pentecostals in general and 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 maybe and and maybe all of us as followers of Jesus need to recapture the outward trajectory of the Spirit's work in us when He comes. And and also, John, I was thinking about how the easiest way I can put it is how how non-colonial God is in all of this. You think <laughs> about you know I I from time to time log into our our podcast hosting account and it shows you all the places in the world that that our podcast is listened to you were you were out uh, in singapore just recently i'm in canada all these places that that were impacted by the by the so-called british empire right and one of the things that the british did throughout the world to ensure it really is a way of enforcing their power and authority is you teach the whole world English, right? If you, that we enforce our language on you, right? Mm. And actually religions throughout the world have done this as well. If you want to, if you want to know God properly, you have to speak this particular language, that particular language. What I love about the day of Pentecost is that here we have a God approving of your language. Here I have a God saying, oh, no, no, the spirit is going to work so that you can hear the praises of God. So you can follow Jesus without going to language school, which speaks again to this God's diversity and investment in the other. And I think it's, I think there's so many across world history from the Romans at the time of Jesus to to the, the French empires, the Spanish empires, the, the British empire, all attempting to force their language and their culture on the other. This is not what mm. we see in Acts. It's working the other way. Yeah. And, and, and the early church got that. Paul says, I'll do, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll yeah. do whatever it takes to help somebody encounter, encounter God. And so, so it's as if God is setting up a trajectory for of himself, but for the church as well. The church is not to be a group of people who go and impose 
their cultures and forms onto others. But but the church is the one that does the hard work, the sacrificing, the the adjustments. We make the changes to welcome the the you know, the newcomer. And and I think it's all kind of hanging around in this beauty of simply being told you can hear God praised in your own language. Mm. That is that is magnificent. I mean, that's magnificent. And in in with great humility, I quote Paul to a Pauline scholar, and <laughs> Paul, in the book of Ephesians, says his intent mm. was mm-hmm. that now through the church, the manifold yeah. wisdom of God would be made known. And and of yes. course, that beautiful idea of manifold, that multi varied, that multi coloured, multi layered. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Paul is speaking there in Ephesians. He's he's speaking of the Jesus who has made the two one. He's he's speaking of the Jesus who has broken down the dividing wall, building this community that reflects the oneness of the God community itself, and mm-hmm. wants to build a community that has global diversity but united around one common idea, and that is Jesus. And I love this that the Spirit is now working among us in in the familiarity of who we are to draw us to the glory of God so that we end up with a diverse community of different languages drawn together by one common idea. Mm. And the common idea, the common goal, the common glory is Jesus himself empowered by the Spirit. And I love that. I love that. And again, that that level ground, that equality, that that sense that there's neither Jew nor nor Greek, there's not there's not slave or free, there's not male mm. and female. There there is an equality here, and that the work of the Spirit is showing an inclusive dynamic where people hear God's word in their own language, but also a missional dynamic where now this new mm. community is being is being empowered. Go to the nations of the world. Mm. Go and take this glorious gospel so that they hear this in their own language mm. and they have it in their own culture. And I think that is just magnificent. And, and also, I, this, I don't think this is new for God. I think God has been doing this all along. And, and it's us that's resistant to this. And, and I'm kind of, let me, let me attribute a thought. And I'm going to leave a note in the show notes for this episode to a blog post by a friend of mine, Phil Odd. And, and Phil has kind of turned my thinking around on this. And I, I love what he's done because he draws a link between the day of Pentecost and the story of Babel in Genesis chapter yes. 11. Right. And now the way I've always been introduced to this, John, is that, and I wonder if this is similar to you, that in Babel, we had one language and God introduces mm. a diversity of languages to almost as a punishment for the people's attempt to, you know, mm. get too big for their boots. And Phil just pointed out recently, and I'll post the, the blog post to Phil's writing on it just for, for uh, Phil runs a great podcast as well. So you can, you can sort of have extra listening if you do that. But he pointed out that actually that's not really the way to read the story of Babel, right? That, that, that actually what he says is actually almost what we're talking about right now, that there's a tendency amongst humans to normalize everything right? The, the tendency for humans is to make everybody the same and do the same thing. And so, and he says, that's exactly what we've got going on in the story of Babel. You've got a group of people trying to stop the spread, trying to stop the diversity and build a big tower so that we can be powerful. And, and, the, and the opening is of, of, of chapter 11 is, now the whole earth had one language yes. and the same words. But Phil said to Phil says in his pod, in his his blog about this. He says, "But but you've not read the previous chapter, right? Yeah, and exactly. the previous chapter, there's a, essentially a list of names. So I understand why people haven't paid close close attention. It's one of those Old Testament <laughs> list of names, and it's a list of names of all of Noah's descendants. But chapter ten, yes. verse thirty one, says these are the mm-hmm. descendants of Shem by their families, their languages." their lands and their nations, right? And and this this la- this happens in chapter 10, verse 5, happens in chapter 10, verse 20, and happens in, cha- happens in chapter 10, verse 31. The same phrase. These are the descendants, yep. their families, their languages, and their lands. So Genesis mm-hmm. tells us that in chapter in chapter 10, there was multiple languages 
on the earth, right? And then, and then we have this gap of time, and then it says, and now the earth had one language in the same words. And what Phil says is this: this is exact. This is now the humans taking over the story, and what humans doing exactly what humans do: let's build a big building, let's build a great empire, and we'll make everybody speak the same. Right? And what does God do is God comes into the Tower of Babel and resets things back to how they're supposed to be, which is diversity of language. And what this does is it causes people to scatter throughout the earth. So there's this tendency within humans to make everybody the same and gather us all in one place. And there's this tendency within God to allow us to maintain our diversity and scatter us throughout the earth. And I think you can take that reading of the story of Babel and drop it right over the story of Acts and see the same thing happening. Tendency is to gather everyone in one place in one language and the Holy Spirit scatters them throughout the earth with multiple languages. And like, I get goosebumps when I look at that because I think now the story of Babel isn't God punishing us by language. But it's it's nope. God resisting empires and normalization yep. to support the diversity and spread of things. Absolutely, it's magnificent. I have come across that as well in some Jewish writings, mm. and uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Yeah, fantastic, yes. fantastic thought. It's a great way to read that because, in some ways, the, the Lord sort of splitting everyone up in languages doesn't it doesn't sort of feel right it doesn't it doesn't make sense in some ways but when you see it as actually god acting against something much more subversive in humanity mm-hmm. then it makes total sense and really? i think that really really fits that i think that's well worthy and and almost at pentecost is a is a dynamic super dry version of that yes. idea no it's fantastic fantastic and then there's all these languages we're hearing god in our own languages. And the people ask, what does this mean? <laughs> and and Peter then launches into this sermon, which probably deserves its own its own episode at very least. Uh, yes, it really, really does. It it sets us up beautifully for the next time. What does this mean? I love that. And the Bible is filled with great questions. And when we ask the right question, it allows a dynamic answer to be presented. And Peter does just that. And that will be the focus of our next couple of podcasts. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope that you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with either of us about something we said, you can reach out to us on podcast at twotexts.com or by liking and following the Two Texts podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you really did enjoy the episode, then we'd love it if you left a review or a comment where you're listening from. And if you really enjoyed this episode, why not share it with a friend? Don't forget that you can listen to all of our podcasts from this season and others at www.2text.com. But that is it for now. So until next time, goodbye.